This is the first half of a lecture on pathogenesis and virulence given on March 30th, 2020. And the focus of this lecture is to define some terminology used in infectious diseases, to explain what microorganisms need in order to survive within the host, and then to talk a little bit about uh, the four stages of how an infectious disease progresses, as well as common routes pathogens can take to be transmitted, and understanding what the terms infectious and lethal dose mean. And so these terms should look pretty familiar. We've used them in class before. Um, but in terms of sort of the infectious disease terminology that I want you to know, the first thing I want you to know is um, host. And a host is just a larger organism that supports the survival and growth of a smaller organism. And so we talked a bit about host cells and host organisms for viruses already. Um, bacterial pathogens or organisms that cause disease also have hosts. And so a pathogen is anything that can cause a disease. Um, it can be either a bacteria or a virus. Um, in some cases, it can also be those acellular particles called viroids um, and prions. And so when a pathogen or this disease-causing agent is growing within or on a host, the host is said to have an infection. And the signs and symptoms and sort of the characteristic hallmarks of damage caused to the host are what are known as an infectious disease. And so two other kind of important terms to understand when talking about infectious diseases are reservoirs, which are the natural environmental locations where pathogens are normally found and live. A reservoir itself can be a living or non-living or animate or inanimate object. Um, <laughs> reservoirs can be things like animals um, or humans. They can also be objects such as um, water or air. And reservoirs can be the source of an infection or the place where the host actually acquires that infection but they don't have to be. And so sometimes reservoir and source are sort of thought of synonymously, um, but they are actually different. The reservoir is just you, where you naturally would find a pathogen living, and the source of an infection is wherever the host acquires that pathogen. So it can acquire it directly from a reservoir. Um, it can also acquire it from a secondary source. And one other important term is of, um, in terms of infectious disease is a vector. And vectors are just organisms that can spread disease from one host to another. And so one example of a vector is mosquitoes um, spreading malaria, right? So mosquitoes don't actually get infected by the disease, nor do any of the vectors, but they do serve as ways to spread disease from one host to another. And so thinking from the pathogen perspective, there are a couple of things that pathogens need to be able to survive within and ultimately be successful enough to cause disease. And the first is a suitable environment to grow or to reproduce. And we've already talked a bit about some of the things that are necessary for growth of microorganisms, especially bacteria. So bacteria require a specific temperature, specific pH range. Um, they have specific oxygen requirements. They're all important to help them grow and reproduce as well as possible. Um, and in some cases, pathogens will actually adapt inside the host in order to survive more effectively. Uh, for example, um, we talked a bit about facultative anaerobes um, in lab specifically. And facultative anaerobes usually will use oxygen if it's available, like it might be in the outside environment, but can adapt to um, an anoxic environment and become anaerobic inside of a host in order to survive. And some pathogens that do that are ones that live inside of your gut. So pathogens, in addition to needing a good environment, also need a source of nutrients or food. Um, in order to get those nutrients, the pathogen will have to compete with the host cells. And one thing that helps it do that are um, <coughs> specific substances or structures that the pathogen makes um, that are known as virulence factors. And we'll talk a bit about what virulence factors do and how they help pathogens acquire these nutrients in the next half of this lecture. So they need environment, they need food, and pathogens also need a way to avoid harm within
mechanism that protects them from both the innate or nonspecific immune response of the host, um, as well as detection and removal by the specific or adaptive immune response. And so once a pathogen in enters the host, it needs to find a good place to grow and reproduce. It needs to find food and it needs a way to be protected. Otherwise, it won't be able to efficiently um, infect the host and ultimately cause disease. And so infectious diseases progress along sort of a stereotypic way um, in four stages. And the first stage begins as soon as you're initially exposed to a pathogen. And so the time from that initial exposure, you can see here in the graph on the right, to the time when you start to show symptoms is known as the incubation period. Incubation periods can vary depending on the disease that you're talking about. But one thing that's important to note is that you don't have signs or symptoms during the incubation period. You also are not contagious. And so this shaded purple area in the graph on the right indicates the time when the disease is communicable or um, contagious to other people. And during that incubation period, <coughs> For the majority of diseases, you are not contagious. As soon as you start to so show any type of sign or symptom, you enter what's known as this prodromal stage, which you can see in green on the graph. And so a sign of disease would be something that's objective that you can measure, like a fever. A symptom is anything that's subjective, like whether you've lost your appetite or feeling tired. And so signs and symptoms will start to appear in the prodromal stage, but most of the time they're not specific enough to diagnose. So you might start to feel tired, but there are a ton of diseases that make you feel tired. And so it's impossible to diagnose what you actually have or are sick with in the prodromal stage, but you do start to become contagious or able to pass that disease to other people. And then the illness is sort of self-explanatory. That's the part of the, of the disease where you're sick, you show all of the characteristic signs and symptoms. They increase in severity or intensity, as you can see by this pink line here on the graph. And that's where, you're, since your disease is most severe, that's where you start to trigger an immune response. And hopefully what that immune response can do here is sort of level out those symptoms <coughs> and lead you into the next period, which is this recovery period or convalescence where those signs and symptoms disappear. Unfortunately, there are some cases where an illness can progress. Your symptoms can't really be ameliorated and you can ultimately die from an infectious disease. With this incubation period, prodromal stage, illness period, and then convalescence is the typical pattern of an um, infectious disease progression. So there are a couple things that kind of go into um, how fast an infection can proceed through those four stages. And so how fast an infection can spread through a host is a function of how resistant that host is to the particular pathogen. So how good its defenses are, how good its immune system is. Um, <coughs> it's also a function of pathogen virulence. Um, which is basically just the amount of harm the pathogen can do once it's inside the host. And it's um, also a function of just how many microorganisms, how many virus particles or how many bacterial cells are present, right? Because you can imagine that in some cases, just by overwhelming a host with a ton of organisms, you can cause an infection to proceed much faster. And so this is usually measured and kind of quantified in a specific way called the infectious dose 50. And that will tell you how infectious a particular pathogen is. And so infectious disease 50 or ID50 is just the number of microorganisms that is required to cause a disease in 50% of people. So if you look at this graph here, this is the percent of hosts who are infected. At 50%, you can draw a line. And then we can look at these dose curves and find the ID50s where 50% of people are infected. And so for strain A, that would be 3,000, and for strain B, that ID50 would be 5,000. 
And this is similar to how you'd find the dose of organisms that's required to actually kill 50% of hosts. You would see a graph similar to this, but rather than call it being called infectious dose 50, that's called lethal dose 50. And that's just the amount of organisms that it would take to actually kill 50% of people who are infected. And so if you look at this graph here, the infectious dose of strain A is 3,000, and the infectious dose of strain B is 5,000, um, which means the infectious dose of strain A is actually less than strain B, which would mean that that pathogen is actually more effective or probably more virulent, more harmful to the host because it requires less microorganisms to cause the same amount of infection. And so um, in addition to having a lower ID50, strain A is likely more virulent than strain B. The lower the ID50, the more virulent the strain. And so pathogens need to be able to infect their hosts in some way, right? They need to go from the reservoir or their natural habitat um, and infect hosts. And there are a couple ways that they do that. Um, <coughs> pathogens can be transmitted through the air in um, what are called droplets or droplet nuclei. So air is not a particularly great medium for growth of pathogens. Um, so they need to use another sort of mechanism inside the air most of the time that's in uh, water droplets or respiratory droplets that come from an infected host. Um, droplets can't really travel as far as droplet nuclei because they are larger. Dust can travel very far. And all of these different things allow pathogens to be transmitted through the air. Um, the, another type of transmission is contact transmission, which is where the pathogen moves to the host via direct contact with a reservoir with the source of infection. And then the last two types are vehicle transmission, where a pathogen uses an inanimate object or substance to pass to the host, and vector-borne transmission, where there's a vector or another organism that transmits path pathogens between the hosts. And so over here you can see different types of transmission airborne transmission, where the pathogen moves to the air in these droplets or droplet nuclei released from a host. <coughs> um, different types of contact transmission, so direct contact where um, the disease can pass from one host to the next, and then indirect contact or vehicle transmission where um, objects such as a doorknob or food or water can act as vehicles or um, inanimate substances that can transfer pathogens. And then down here, you can see the vector-borne transmission um, where pathogens are transmitted by another vector, in this case, some very small mosquitoes, uh, transferring that pathogen to this new host.